Hi friends, welcome to Kraku's online classes. I'm Saili Kale. I'm one of the co-founders of Kraku and an alumna of IIM Ahmedabad. In today's class, we'll be basically uh, revising quant. Uh, so we'll be covering all the must-do topics in quant. Uh, uh, in this, uh, because it's such a vast topic, we have split this up over two videos. We'll be covering geometry and arithmetic in this video, and we'll be covering the remaining uh, quant topics in the next video. So uh, this is going to be kind of the crux of quant as far as CAT is concerned. Uh, we'll be just doing, as I said, the must-do topics. There are certain uh, areas of quant that we won't deep dive into, which are part as such of the portion, but uh, 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 where uh, questions from that topic are unlikely to be asked. So this is a revision lecture, so treat it like a revision lecture. This is not the first time you should be hearing of a concept. Uh, this is just basic, uh, basically a checklist of all the things that you should know going into CAT 2018. So basically, uh, if you find any formula or a concept that you're not uh, familiar with, if you're not comfortable with, please make sure you go down, uh, go to the actual classroom video or actual concept video and actually check what is given in depth about that particular concept. Here I won't be explaining each concept in detail, I'll just be mentioning the concepts and how to use them. So the uh, focus would be on essentially giving you a checklist of concepts and formulas that you must remember going into CAT. So let's get started. We'll begin with uh, geometry. Uh, the most important part of geometry is triangles. That's the fundamental uh, uh, part which will help you in understanding almost all other parts as far as CAT is concerned. So let's get started with triangles. So the first basic property of triangles is that the sum of two sides is always greater than the third side. So A plus B will be greater than C, B plus C is greater than A and A plus C is greater than B. Uh, this means that uh, no triangle can be formed such that uh, uh, sum of two sides is less than or equal to the third side. This is essentially the limiting condition whenever you have to form triangles. So whenever you are asked how many triangles are possible, think of this basic limiting condition. So this puts uh, the uh, limit on the number of values or the range of values that the third side can take given uh, two sides of a triangle. So that is the basic property of a triangle. Uh, then apart from this, uh, there are two properties of a triangle given A, B, C. So we always define like the angle as capital A opposite the side small a, this as capital C and this is uh, capital B. So this is angle B, angle C, angle A. So the uh, two properties that will help you in either determining the length given the angle or determine the angle given length are the sine rule and cosine rule. These are not absolute must knows, but they can help you solve questions that are uh, uh, difficult or reduce the complexity of questions as such. So what is the sine rule? The sine rule basically says that, so before you in, uh, we go to the sine rule, always remember the fact that as the angle uh, opposite to a side grows, uh, the length of that side grows. So if it's a, a acute angle like this, the length of the side will be shorter. If it's a right angle, then it will be a certain way. If it is an obtuse angle, it will be uh, larger. So as this angle grows, the length of the side, as you can see, keeps on growing. Uh, so this is the basic uh, property of uh, triangles as such. Uh, in an, uh, if this is A, B and C, if this is an acute angle triangle, then C square will be less than A square plus B square. If this is a right angle triangle, then this is A, B and this is C, then C square is equal to A square plus B square. This is the Pythagoras theorem. So, and if this is an obtuse angle triangle that is greater than 90 degrees, then uh, C square will be greater than A square plus B square. So, as you can see that the side goes on increasing as the angle opposite to it increases. So the uh, pro uh, like the constant of proportionality is not like, uh, 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 there's a constant of proportionality which can be, uh, so basically it doesn't increase proportionally with the angle, it pro increases proportionally with the sine of the angle. So uh, A by sine A is equal to B by sine B is equal to C by sine C. So you can say that C grows uh, C is proportional to sine C. So uh, the, essentially C is equal to K times sine C. So as the sine of the angle increases, the side increases. So this is the basic idea behind uh, uh, the pro uh, angles and the sides opposite to them. Uh, the sine rule, uh, it's pretty easy to remember and it might be useful for you as uh, while solving some questions if like either the length of a side is asked or uh, if you need the sine value of an angle, then this would be uh, helpful. 
Uh, another uh, formula that can uh, that you can use to either find the sine value or the cosine value is the cosine rule that says that cos a is equal to b square plus c square minus a square upon 2bc. So if you are given two sides and the included angle, suppose you are given b, you are given c and you are given the included angle that is a and you know the uh, cos value of a. Uh, then using that cos value and using the values of bc, you can find out what is the third side as such. So this is useful when you have to figure out what is the length of a side or if you have to figure out given three sides of a triangle, if you want to figure out what is the cosine value of a particular angle, you can do that. So these are basic rules that can help you understand the different elements of a triangle. Now we will go to the fundamental rule that uh, fundamental theorem essentially that is used in most of the uh, while solving most of the questions that come from triangles. Uh, now we will come to a theorem which is kind of fundamental so to solving all questions that come from uh, triangles that is like uh, one of the most uh, important theorems as far as CAT is concerned that is the proportionality theorem. So what does the proportionality theorem say? So the proportionality theorem says that suppose there is a uh, triangle ABC and you draw a line DE parallel to BC. If you draw a line DE parallel to BC, uh, then uh, DE will split AB in the same ratio as it will split AC. So what does this mean? This means that AD by, DE, uh, AD by DB is equal to AE by EC. Uh, uh, so basically this ratio, the ratio of this part to this part is equal to the ratio of this part to this part. So how does this come about? If you think of it from similar triangles perspective, uh, since these two lines are parallel to each other, this angle will be equal to this angle, this angle will be equal to this angle and this angle is common to both sides as such. So because of this, uh, by using the uh, AA property of similarity, I can say that triangle ADE is similar to triangle ABC. So what can you say by uh, from this you can say that AD by AB is equal to AE by AC. Now AB is basically uh, or you can say AB by AD is equal to AC by AE. Now AB is essentially AD plus DB. Uh, by using like dividendo I can say that uh, AB by AB minus AD by AD is equal to AC minus AE by AE. So from this you can derive that AD by uh, DB by uh, AD is equal to AE uh, EC by AE or inverse of that is this theorem essentially. So proportionality theorem is nothing but an extension of similarity of triangles concept. But this theorem is extremely important as far as CAT is concerned because uh, generally what happens is that you will be asked uh, using this basic concept you will be asked ratios of areas, you will be asked to find uh, lengths of some sides given the length of the bigger triangle or length of the smaller triangle or at times like a bigger figure will be split up into smaller parts where the smaller parts are essentially where one side is parallel to the uh, one side of the bigger uh, triangle as such. So using all of these things you can figure out the ratios of areas, you can figure out the uh, lengths of the sides and all of that uh, thing because uh, all of those questions can be solved using this basic theorem. So whenever you see that any uh, side or any uh, side of a figure is parallel to any other side of the figure like for example one side of the triangle is parallel to another side of another triangle then you can use this concept to figure out ratios of areas etc. So remember this triangle or uh, remember this theorem whenever you see parallel sides as such. Now uh, this is the uh, another theorem that is useful in solving questions on triangles is the Apollonius theorem. So what does the Apollonius theorem say? Uh, it says that in a triangle ABC If AD is the median of uh, uh, if AD is a median that means BD is equal to DC then AB square plus AC square is equal to 2 times AD square plus BD square. So uh, in case you have difficulty remembering the equation as such just remember the fact that if this were a uh, isosceles triangle in an isosceles triangle you know that the median is at right angles. So in case of an isosceles triangle because uh, these are uh, isosceles triangles this would be uh, the midpoint this would be the midpoint this would be a right angle triangle 
and this side would be equal to this side. So just you can see that uh, by using Pythagoras theorem, uh, AD uh, square plus DC square will be equal to AC square and uh, same on the left hand side of the figure also for uh, triangle ABD also. So using that you can figure out that this would be the equation. This is a general equation, it does not uh, uh, apply only to isosceles triangles. But by using the example of isosceles triangles, you can confirm once again that you have gotten the expression right. Generally, this is a trick that I often use to remember expressions. Uh, uh, I, if, one, if, I, uh, if I'm not sure whether I have remembered the equation correctly if, uh, or if I've remembered the formula correctly, I check it against some uh, commonly uh, understood, uh, uh, commonly uh, used uh, or like very uh, simple uh, triangles or simple forms as such. So if something is applicable for equilateral triangle and if I know the uh, general theorem as such, then I know that if I check it once on the equilateral triangle and it applies, then I have remembered the equation correctly. Uh, it might not, not uh, necessarily be the case that whatever is true for equilateral triangle is true for all triangles, but uh, you can uh, quickly uh, correct any errors that have crept up into your formulas by once checking it with an equilateral triangle. So for example, if you f sometimes uh, people forget whether this is two times or this is three times or what it is. So if you can just check it once with an isosceles triangle or an equilateral triangle, you can quickly see why it should be two times AD square plus BD square. So always have these uh, tricks in your uh, this that if you don't remember the formula, what can you do to like uh, quickly check whether or not the expression that you have written down is correct or not. So this is the Apollonius theorem. Uh, the Apollonius theorem as you can see is applicable whenever you have a median given. Uh, so whenever a median is given, all automatically think of the Apollonius theorem. Another time when you should think of the Apollonius theorem is when you are asked for squares of sides. Whenever you have to find out what is the square value of this side or what is the sum of squares of two sides, then you should automatically think of the Apollonius theorem. Uh, so this is one thing that you can do uh, whenever uh, squares of sides are asked or a median is given. Now let's go on to uh, some basic properties of triangles. So as I said, uh, we have discussed the sides of the triangles and we have discussed the angles that are there. So before uh, we move on to uh, more uh, uh, like congruency of triangles and similarity of triangles, I will first want to define uh, some basic parts of triangles. So uh, suppose this is a triangle ABC. So if you draw a uh, perpendicular bisector for all the three sides, so for example, if, if this is the perpendicular bisector for BC, this is a perpendicular bisector for AC and this is a perpendicular bisector for AB, then all three of the perpendicular bisectors will pass through a point which is known as the circumradius of the circle. So what is the circumradius of the circle? The circumradius of the circle is the point which is equidistant from all three vertices of the circle. So what does it mean that it is equidistant from all three vertices of the circle? It means that if you take the circumradius, take uh, suppose this circumradius is capital, uh, say capital, um, uh, capital R and with this uh, capital R if you take AR as the uh, length and if you draw a circle that circle will pass through all three vertices of the circle. So this is basically the circum, uh, circum circle of the triangle uh, all three vertices of the triangle. So this is basically the circum circle of the triangle. So AR will be the circum radius and R will be the circumcenter of the triangle. Now this is when you took perpendicular bisectors of the sides. Now instead of taking perpendicular bisectors, if you took say angle bisectors, what would you get? Well if you took angle bisectors in a triangle ABC like this, so you have an angle bisector here, an angle bisector here and an angle bisector here, then all three angle bisectors will will cross at a point I which is called the I is the in center. So the in center is the point which is equidistant from all three sides of the circle. That means if you take the perpendicular distance from one side of the circle and you draw a circle by taking that distance as the length, then that then all three sides of the triangle will be tangential to the circle as such. So this circle will be inscribed inside the triangle. So here uh, the this length r would be the in radius and uh, i is the in center of the circle. So this is what is uh, uh, an in center, this is when there is we have taken angular bisectors. This is if we have perpendicular bisectors. Now 
Now the third type is if we take uh, instead of uh, perpendicular bisectors, if we take uh, altitude. So what is an altitude? So an altitude is a perpendicular drop from the vertex of the triangle. So suppose this is a triangle ABC, if you drop a perpendicular from A to BC, then this uh, and it intersects at D, then AD is a perpendicular, uh, AD is a altitude of the triangle. Uh, the altitude part is important because it is essentially the height of the triangle and height of the triangle is important while uh, estimating the area of the triangle. So if you have, uh, uh, if you draw altitudes from all the three vertices, they will intersect at the point known as the orthocenter. This is for altitudes. And uh, the, uh, this is called the ortho radius. Now the last and the most important part is when the medians intersect. So suppose this is ABC and AD is a median of the triangle and BE is the another median of the triangle and CF is another median of the triangle then all three of them intersect at the point known as the centroid of the triangle. Uh, so this is uh, these two lengths are equal, these two lengths are equal, these two lengths are equal and uh, this G is the centroid of the triangle. This we get when we uh, when medians intersect. One important uh, uh, aspect that you need to remember about uh, centroid is that the centroid divides the median in the ratio 2 is to 1 that is AG by GD is equal to 2 is to 1. Now if you can think of uh, uh, so uh, most of you would already know the fact that uh, area of a triangle is half into uh, uh, base into height. Now if you think of the triangles ABD, ABC and uh, triangles GBC, you see that BC is the common base. So base is common half into BC is common and height 1 of the triangle and this would be half into BC into height 2 of GBC. Now if you think that uh, AG and GD are in the ratio 2 is to 1. So if you drop a perpendicular, say this is the perpendicular, this is the altitude and this is AE. Now if I drop a, par draw a parallel line, so this say the parallel line from GA uh, which is parallel to BC, if it intersects AE at F, I uh, will try to be more careful but this is kind of uh, oh, in the same area. So let me try to draw it out in a bigger area. So suppose this is AD. And uh, this is the perpendicular uh, AE and say this is point G. So you know that this is 2 is to 1. Now if you draw a line parallel to BC called GF. So we know from proportionality theorem that if GF is parallel to DE, then it will uh, 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 divide uh, G AE in the same ratio as it divides uh, AD. So even this would be 2 is to 1. So from what, this what can you infer? From this I can infer that the height of the entire triangle, uh, the height uh, of this triangle ABC would be if it is 3x, then the height of triangles GBC would be 1 by, th uh, 1 by 3 times 3x that is x. So how do I get this? This is I get from the fact that this is the height of the entire triangle, A is the height of the entire triangle and this line GF uh, will be uh, if I draw parallel to it. So this is essentially the height of triangle GBC, but this is a rectangle GF uh, uh, say M, GF EM would be a rectangle. So whatever is GM, FE would be the same amount. So the height of the triangle uh, GBC would be uh, essentially one third of the height of the triangle ABC. So from this I can infer that height H2 is equal to one third of height H1. So what can you infer from this information? So from the fact that the bases are common, and the height of the cent from the centroid of the triangle is one third as the height of the entire triangle. I can see that the triangle uh, formed by uh, the base with the centroid will be one third the side of uh, size of the entire triangle as such. So what does this mean? This means that the centroid divides the triangle into three equal halves by uh, area. This is an important point to remember whenever you have a centroid of a triangle. The centroid divides uh, the triangle into three equal parts by area. 
so this uh, these are the uh, specific parts as far as uh, specific components of triangles as such now that you know these components let's try to go on to uh, two more theorems uh, uh, two more concepts which are like central to uh, solving questions on triangles first is the internal angle bisector theorem this is not very often used but whenever you see that something is an angle bisector you should remember this theorem so this says that if ad is the angle bisector of angle a then a uh, the angle bisector internal angle bisector of a will divide the opposite side in the same ratio as the enclosing two sides so what does this mean that this side will be proportional to this side and this side will be proportional to this side so ab by ac will be equal to bd by bc so you can logically see this also suppose the angle is kind of screwed like this uh, towards like skewed towards one side then you have the angle bisector here so this is the angle bisector and uh, you can see that ab is clearly much smaller than ac correspondingly bd will also be smaller as compared to dc the uh, the more uh, skewed uh, the one side is the sk more skewed this ratio is where one side is much more uh, 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 bigger than the other side uh, the uh, more uh, this ratio would also be affected so you can see logically that this they have a some uh, constant of proportionality between them so by internal angle uh, bisector theorem we can uh, clearly show that ab by bc is uh, ab by ac is equal to bd by dc so whenever you see that you are asked for ratio of sides or ratio of areas always remember the and an internal bisector is given angle bisector is given always remember this theorem now we'll come to the basic core of uh, uh, triangles uh, if you know the congruency and similarity concept or uh, you can almost solve all questions that come from triangles even if you don't remember some of the specific formulas or theorems as such this is just just because that uh, congruency and similarity of triangles is such a powerful concept that it is uh, so useful in almost all kinds of uh, it has like wide applications it can be used as a building block for all kinds of theorems as such so what does similarity and congruency of triangles say so two triangles abc and def are said to be congruent if they have the same shape and the same size when can you say that two two triangles have the same shape if they have three all three angles are the same then you can say that the two triangles have the same shape when can you say that uh, the two triangles have the same size when their areas are equal so for two triangles to be congruent uh, their shape should be the same their size should be the same so there are three uh, there are three basic properties and one property which is uh, associated with right angle triangles so the three basic properties are sss sas and asa and for right angle triangles there is an additional property called rhs so what do these properties basically say the sss test of congruency is that if two triangles have uh, Uh, are of such a form that the corresponding sides are equal that is if ab is equal to de uh, ac is equal to df and bc is equal to ef then by sss property of congruency we can say that abc is congruent to triangle def so it's important that you write it in the same order as the congruency so if ab is uh, congruent to equal to de then uh, you should be able to pick out the pairs of two accordingly so ab is uh, congruent to de ef is uh, congruent to bc and ca is congruent to fd so you should always be careful in what order you write the vertices so this is basically the sss test for congruency so why is this test for congruency uh, 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 useful basically if you are given two uh if you are given a triangle if you define all three sides there is only one triangle that is possible given three sides of the triangle so if you have any way in which you can uniquely determine a triangle then you can uh, use that as a uh, test for uh, checking the uh, congruency of two triangles so, so for, for example if you have uh, this side if you have this side and if you have this side you have uniquely determined a triangle you can't have more than uh, one type of a triangle given three sides of the triangle similarly if you have one side 
and you have the other side and you have the angle between them then you have uniquely determined the uh, triangle because the third side you can just complete by drawing the end points of the other two sides. So if you have the side and you have the angle between the two sides, uh, if you have sides, angle side, then also you can uniquely determine a triangle and by that you can uh, say that two triangles if they have the same uh, sides, uh, two sides and the enclosed angle is equal, then those two triangles are congruent to each other. Now what does ASA mean? ASA says that if you have two angles and a side which is there between those two angles, then you can uh, uh, then those two triangles would be congruent. Now why would this be the case? Suppose you are drawing a uh, triangle in this way, suppose you first draw the side, then you draw an angle at x degrees, you draw an angle at y degrees. Just by doing this you have uniquely formed the triangle. There is no more information needed for you to draw the triangle. So you can uniquely determine the triangle given a side and the two angles that are there on that side. So using ASA property you can test whether two triangles are congruent or not. Now what is RHS property? RHS property says that if the hypotenuse of two triangles for two right angle triangles if the hypotenuse of say ABC is the right angle triangle DEF is the right angle triangle if uh, the hypotenuse of uh, one triangle is equal to the hypotenuse of the other triangle and one of the other sides is equal so AB is equal to DE then we can say that ABC is congruent to DEF. Now this is essentially an ex extension of SSS property because by Pythagoras theorem you know if you have one side and the hypotenuse then the third side will also be determinable by the uh, Pythagoras theorem. So the third side will also be equal in, the, in both the triangles because of Pythagoras theorem. So essentially it will be a form of SSS uh, uh, property of congruency. So these are the th uh, four checks for congruency of triangles. So these are essentially checking whether they have the same shape that is the internal angles are same and whether they have the same area. So all three, all three sides of the triangle corresponding sides of the triangle should be equal all uh, corresponding angles should be equal and uh, as a result if all three sides and angles are equal the height of the triangles will also be equal. So what does this mean? So suppose if you have uh, so in, if even if it's not like this if you have two triangles of this form where you have uh, a, B, C and uh, uh, D, E, F. Now if you have the fact that uh, uh, suppose you know that all angles of uh, these two triangles are equal, okay, this angle is equal, this angle is equal to this angle, this triangle uh, angle is equal to this angle and this angle, all the corresponding angles are equal. So now if you know that all corresponding angles are equal, you know that they have the same shape. Now you have to check whether they have the same size. So for them to have the same size, they should have the same area. So if you know that BC is equal to EF and the heights of the triangles are equal, then you know they are the same area. So even if you don't have any of these uh, uh, four properties, if you can determine that the areas of the two triangles are equal, the heights are the same or the base is the same for the same height, then you know that those two triangles will be congruent triangles. So all uh, for congruent triangles, once you figure out that ABC is congruent to DEF, you can infer that corresponding sides will be equal, corresponding angles will be equal. They will have the same area and the same shape. Now similar triangles is kind of a superset of congruent triangles. They are triangles that have the same shape but not necessarily the same size. So essentially if uh, say suppose ABC is a, a triangle and say DEF is another triangle. So the corresponding angle should be equal. So angle BC, BAC should be equal to angle EDF. This angle should be equal to this angle and this angle will be equal to this angle. Now this means that they have the same shape as such but they need not have the same size. For the same size they, sh uh, they not, need not have the same area as such. So all you need to check is whether or not the uh, shape is the same. So for you to check whether the shape is the same, you need to check whether all three angles are equal. So this is the AA test for uh, similarity. If the three angles of a uh, triangle, uh, if of two triangles are equal, if corresponding angles are equal, then the two triangles will be similar to each other. Another test that is there is that, uh, so uh, we have an SSS test here. So it, uh, you need not have AAA test by uh, just triangle property you can infer that since uh, if two triangles, uh, two angles are equal the third angle will have to be equal because that will be 180 minus the sum of these two angles. So you can also call it the AA property or AA test for similarity. The third second test is the SSS test. 
in sss test we are not looking whether the three uh, sides are equal we are just seeing whether the three sides are in the same proportion what do i mean by same proportion i mean that the corresponding side so suppose ab corresponds to de then ab by de should be equal to ac by df should be equal to bc by ef so the side should be in the same proportion so this is essentially saying that uh, if this is a triangle i have another triangle of the exact same shape but it might be bigger or smaller than this triangle but the uh, size is the same a uh, shape is the same so the area might be twice thrice or any uh, n, n uh, number of times of the original uh, triangle as such so the ratio of the corresponding side should be the same similarly you can have an sas test also where the two sides are in proportion so say ab is a uh, ab by de is equal to ac by df and you know that angle a is equal to angle d by using just this check also you can say that the two angles two triangles are similar to each other and the third uh, fourth property is basically the same as uh, asa which is that uh, if two angles are uh, equal to each other and the included side is in uh, uh, is uh, in the same proportion then you can say that these two triangles are this if two triangles are e two angles are equal you can just say that by a property they are similar triangles so this is the basic funda of similar triangles in similar triangles you have to remember that all angles corresponding angles will be equal to each other the sides uh, will be in the same proportion so as in like uh, if uh, uh this side if the uh, side of one triangle is twice the side of the other triangle corresponding side of the other triangle then all sides of this triangle will be two times the side of this triangle the same proportion will exist for the height of the triangle as well so if for if base this base is two times this base then the height h would be two times the height of the smaller triangle so the essentially all uh, dimensions of this triangle all uh, lengths of this triangle will be two times the lengths of uh, the smaller triangle so the proportion exists for all uh, parts of this triangle essentially so whenever you have two similar triangles they'll have the same uh, internal angles corresponding angles will be equal and all the corresponding sides will be in the same proportion so that is what you have to remember uh, if sides are in proportion since area is essentially a product of the sides the areas will be in the uh, so suppose if uh, this is a ab by de uh, ac by df and bc by uh, ef is essentially say k then uh, triangle abc ratio of area of triangle abc to def will be k square this is because uh, uh, your area is half into base into height now uh, your base will be k times the base of uh, the uh, triangle def your height will be k times the height of def so essentially here you will have k into k into uh, area of triangle def so k square times at area of triangle df so if the ratio of the sides are in um, uh, ratio k then the area will be in uh, the ratio of the area will be k square so this is basically what you have to remember with similar and congruent triangles uh, i can't stress enough how important this topic is as far as cat is concerned or as far as solving questions is in cat is concerned this is one of the fundamental building blocks uh, you might use other methods to solve triangles but uh, there is always an alternate method with where you can solve the uh, question using congruency or similarity of triangles similarity of triangles particularly is a very very powerful uh, tool for uh, solving questions so please make sure that you have a very good hold on these topics so now we'll come to the concept of area of triangles so as i said uh, the basic basic formula for triangles is half into base into height you should obviously know this by now uh, another uh, formula these two are kind of the uh, three formulas that you should remember for cat these two formulas are not formulas for deriving area rather it is, they are formulas for deriving the in radius and circum radius given the area so what are these formulas let us just first figure out so as you know the basic formula is half into base into height so if this is abc what is height height is the length of the perpendicular dropped from the vertex so if bc is the base then area of the triangle is essentially half into bc into the length of the uh, perpendicular drop from a so that is ad so you should always uh, know that whenever you know have the height of the triangle then you have very important information available to calculate the area of the triangle so that is how you calculate the area of the triangle in most cases 
Now suppose you don't have the height of the triangle, but you are given all the three lengths of the triangle. So suppose you have ABC, then what should you do? In case you have all the three lengths of the triangle, then you can just calculate the semi-perimeter. So se you know the perimeter is the sum of all three sides of the triangle. So semi-perimeter is just sum of all three sides of the triangle divided by 2. So this is the semi-perimeter of the triangle. Given the semi-perimeter of the triangle, you can use this formula uh, and your ABC are the lengths of the three sides. Using this formula, you can calculate the area of the triangle. Now, I, uh, in case you don't remember these formulas, I always use a simple trick to remember these kind of formulas. So just use A345, uh, uh, say ABC is A345 uh, 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 triangle. So basically, this is a simple right angle triangle. So in this case, you know, you can easily calculate the area because in this case, this will be the height of the triangle, 3 will be the height of the triangle, 4 will be the base of the triangle. So area will be half into 3 into 4, that is 6. So if you want, if you are not sure whether you have remembered this uh, formula correctly, try to use this formula to calculate the area of this particular triangle. You know that the area is 6, so 6 should be, uh, what you should check whether the answer that you get should be 6. So now I plug in the values here. Uh, in this case, the semi-perimeter would be 3 plus 4, that's 7, plus 5, that is 12. So, semi-perimeter is 12 by 2, that is 6. So, I get 6 into 6 minus 3, that's 3, 6 minus 4, that's 2, into 6 minus 5, that's 1. So, this is equal to square root of 6 into 6, that is 6. So, I've gotten the same value as I uh, get from half into base into height. So, clearly the formula that I remember is correct. So, these are uh, small, small tricks that you can use if you're not sure that the formula that you remember from geometry is correct or not. Just use simple, uh, uh, easy to remember, uh, easy to calculate uh, uh, triangles to check whether or not your formula that you remember, uh, that you have uh, uh, memorized is correct or not. Uh, another uh, area uh, 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 area formula that uh, is sometimes useful, especially while calculating like ratios of triangles, uh, ratios of areas and all. So suppose if you have a, uh, if you have to calculate ratios of areas and you know that uh, like one of the angles is common or any something of that sort. If you have, uh, uh, if you have to calculate ratios of two areas, say ABC and triangle DEF and you know that one of the angles is the com uh, is a common angle, then you can use this uh, so that uh, you can then just uh, uh, convert it into a uh, ratio of uh, product of two sides of the triangle. And if those sides are known, then you can find out the ratio of the areas easily. So as I said, uh, this is a simple, this is half AB into sin C. So basically, if this is your triangle ABC, so this is angle A, this is angle B, this is angle C. So, in this case, this would be A, this is B, this is C. So, for calculating this area, you need uh, the length of two sides of the triangle. So, this side and this side and the sine of the angle that is included between these two sides. So, that you get as sin C. So, you have half into A into B into sin C. Now, if you are not sure whether you have remembered this formula correctly, you can use a simple equilateral triangle. Uh, say, equilateral triangle of side 6. Now, if this is 6, this is 6, this is 6 and this angle will be 60 degrees. Now, for an equilateral triangle, the area of an equilateral triangle is 3 by 4 A square where A is the side of the triangle. So, this is 3 by 4 times third, uh, 6 square. So, this is equal to 9 root 3. So, this is what the area of the equilateral triangle should be. Now, if I use half into AB into sin C, what do I get? Half into a in AB is 36 into sin C that is sin 60 so that I get half into 36 into root 3 by 2. So I get essentially 9 root 3. So my formula is obviously right. So this is how I generally keep a check on whether or not I have remembered the formula correctly. So the area of uh, a triangle is half AB sin C. Now uh, what do you, uh, so this uh, as far as uh, uh, areas of triangles are concerned, mostly you will be able to find out the area of a triangle given these three formulas. We will discuss the formula for coordinate geometry in the later part of this video where we discuss coordinate geometry in detail. So we will keep that for now. Now the two formulas that are there after that, here the object is not really to uh, calculate the area but rather to calculate the in radius and circum radius. Because if you had ABC, you would not use this uh, formula to calculate the area, you just use this formula to calculate the area in that case. So essentially these are used to calculate the in radius or the circum radius if you know the area. 
So now let's consider the f uh, fourth uh, this that is area is equal to uh, semi perimeter into in radius. Now in this case, how do I check whether or not with, uh, the formula that I have remembered is correct or not? Now just take the case of this equilateral triangle with side six. In this case, the semi perimeter is eighteen by uh, eighteen by two that is nine. So uh, area is nine root three. Semi perimeter is nine into the in radius. So in radius will be root three. Similarly, the last formula is area is equal to ABC. So that is six into six into six. That is two hundred and sixteen divided by four times R. So R is equal to two root three. So the circum radius of this uh, uh, equilateral triangle would be two root three, and the uh, in radius would be root three. So this is one easy way in which you can calculate the in radius and the circum radius of a given triangle. If you know the area and you know the sides of the triangle, you can easily calculate the in radius and the circum radius of the triangle. So uh, one thing that you should note over here is the in radius, uh, circum radius is two times the in radius. This is true only for equilateral triangles. Only in equilateral triangles is the circum radius equal to two times the in radius. In all other triangles, circum radius will be greater than two times the in radius. This is a property that can sometimes help you. Uh, if you are asked about in radius and circum radius as such, the reason for this is that uh, essentially the equilateral triangle maximizes the area that is in such a way that you can draw the largest possible circle inside that area. So, for example, if you have an odd shaped triangle like this, though the area might be uh, a lot because all of this area on this side of the circle is wasted, the in radi uh, radius of the circle that you can draw inside this particular triangle will be small. So it's kind of wasted for you to have an odd shaped triangle like this. The in radius is maximized when uh, the triangle is an equilateral triangle, and the max value of the in radius is half times the circum radius. So that's like a formula that uh, that's a particular uh, this that you can use for uh, uh, if you can remember for uh, 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 for using for uh, uh, calculating the uh, uh, circum radius and in radius uh, of uh, uh, given an area. So these are the basic formulas for areas of triangles. So now that we have covered triangles, let's start with circles. So uh, as you know, the basic properties of a circle are uh, given a circle. Say this is O, this is the radius R. Then the area of the circle will be pi R square, and the circumference will be two pi R. So uh, we'll cover most of the advanced properties of circles. Mostly we'll focus on chords and tangents, tangents as such. So first, let's cover chords. So what is a chord? A chord is any line joining two points on the circle. So if this is A and this is B, then AB is the chord of the circle. A diameter of the circle is also a chord. So suppose say CD is a diameter of the circle. It is also a chord. It is a special type of chord because it passes through the center of the circle. Now there are certain properties of chords. Uh, we I'll try to cover them by linking them to each other so that if you remember one property, you should be able to remember all properties of the chord. Uh, some basic uh, nomenclature associated with circles. So essentially, if uh, this is uh, this is a uh, if AB is the uh, chord, so the part of the circle which is like the which contains the major area is called the major segment. So that is so essentially the a chord other than a di uh, diameter will split the circle into unequal parts. The bigger part will be the major segment. The smaller part will be the minor segment. So this is the major segment. This will be the minor segment. Now this is a segment. Uh, AOB would be the arc of the circle. This would be a segment. So that is uh, uh, some basic nomenclature that you need to know uh, about the circle. So what does the first property of chord say? The chord say, uh, first property of chord says that if AB is a chord, then it uh, the angle subtended by chord AB uh, at uh, at any point in the major segment of the circle is half the angle subtended by it at the center of the circle. So suppose this is C and this is the center of the circle O. Then if it subtends x at point C, if the angle subtended by AB at point C is x, then the angle subtended by AB at point O will be 2x. So from this, I can infer that if the uh, angle subtended by uh, on the major segment on uh, on the major segment is half of the angle subtended by uh, the chord at the center, from this I can infer that if I subtend an angle at any point on the major segment, that it would be half of this angle. 
So all of these angles should be x, irrespective of which point I choose. I choose this point, this point or any point. The minute I connect it with A and B, this angle will be x. So from this I can infer that the chord will subtend, the angle subtended by a chord in the same segment. So in this case, all of the angles were subtended in the major segment. So the angle subtended by the chord in the same segment will be uh, at different points on the same circle are equal. So all of these will be x in the same segment. Uh, if you know the fund of cyclic quadrilaterals, you know that in the opposite side, this angle, uh, because A, suppose this is D, then A, D, B, C will be a cyclic quadrilateral. And on the basis of the fact that it will be a cyclic quadrilateral, this will be 180 minus X. So all of these angles in the minus segment will also be 180 minus X. So all the angles in the minor segment will be equal, all the angles in the major segment will be equal. So a chord will subtend the same angle in the major, uh, in the same segment of the circle. So if you remember this fact that the angle subtended by a chord in the major segment of the circle is half of the angle subtended by it in the, at the center of the circle. From this you can infer that the angle subtended by, the, by any chord on the same segment at different points at, on the circle is equal. So from uh, 1 you can infer 4. From 1 you can also infer that since we know that a uh, diameter is just a special type of a chord. So since uh, it, just a, it is just a special type of a chord, it should fo uh, follow this value. That is this angle should be, this angle should be half of this angle which is, uh, if this AB is a diameter of the circle, it passes through O. So the angle subtended by AB at O is 180 degrees. So from this we can infer that the diameter would subtend 90 degrees at any point on the circumference of the circle. So the angle subtended by a diameter at the circumference of the circle will be 90 degrees. So the diameter subtends a right angle at the circle. So from 1 we can also infer 2. Now let's come to the third point. Uh, so for this uh, I can actually uh, 3 and 5 I can link together. So let me make some space for that first. Uh, so, okay. so uh, this says that uh, two chords that are equidistant from the center of the circle are always equal in length. This in fact I can infer from similar triangles. So how do I can, how can I infer from similar triangles? So suppose these are the two chords that is A, B and C, D. Now what this says is that if they are equidistant from the center of the circle O, then they will be equal in length. Now suppose this is the diagram where, uh, uh, so you say H is the length of the uh, length uh, distance of O from AB and H is also the distance of O from CD. So we know that these two are uh, radii, so these, this is R, this is R, this is R, this is R. So I, ha I know that uh, two sides of uh, the uh, triangle say, that is triangle AOB and triangle COB, uh, COD. So from this I can see that two sides of, uh, two corresponding sides of these triangles are equal and the height of the triangle is also equal. Therefore I can infer that this, uh, uh, because two sides of the triangle are equal and the height is also equal, I can infer that the size of the triangle should be equal or these two triangles will be congruent triangles. From the fact that these two triangles are congruent triangles, I can say that AB is equal to CD. So uh, from this I can infer that two chords that are equidistant from the center of the circle are always equal in length. So AB will be equal to CD. Correspondingly, if two, uh, if two uh, chords are equal in length, they will be congruent triangles and because they are congruent triangles, their heights will be the same. And because their heights will be the same, we can infer that they are equidistant from the circle. So this is true vice versa, that if two chords are equidistant from the circle, they are equal in length. And if two chords are equal in length, they are equidistant from the circle. So this we can infer from by using congruency of triangles. So also what uh, something that we can infer from the congruency of triangles concept is that, so as I drew this, this is R, this is R. And uh, suppose this is the perpendicular uh, from O to uh, chord AB. Now you can see that these two triangles, that say suppose this is M, so AMO and uh, uh, BMO, for both of these triangles, one side is R, the other side is H. So from this concept, I can see from the RHS test of congruency, I can say that AMO is uh, 
congruent to triangle uh, BMO. So, from this test of congruency, I can say that this length should be equal to this length. Therefore, any perpendicular drawn from the center of the circle to a chord will also bisect the chord. So, OM will be a perpendicular bisector of the chord because this is essentially an isosceles triangle and an isosceles triangle, the uh, altitude drop from the uh, vertex with the isosceles sides will bisect the third side as such. So, we can infer the fifth property as well. Now, let us come to the last property that is uh, if two chords A, B and C, D intersect at N, then A, M into B, M is equal to C, M into D, M. So, for this I will draw, uh, this is uh, kind of difficult to understand initially, but if you use the concept of similarity of triangles, it is pretty easy to understand. So, suppose these are two intersecting chords A, B and C, D and they intersect at M. Now, if you take the first uh, concept that uh, the angle subtended by a chord is the same in the uh, same uh, segment of the circle. So, if the chord is AD, then I can say that I will just join these two uh, uh, lines as such. If the chord is AD, then this angle will be equal to this angle because these two angles are essentially angles subtended by the chord AD. Similarly, if I consider the chord BC, this angle will be equal to this angle because both are angles subtended by the chord. Uh, BC in the uh, same segment and this angle will be equal to this angle because they are opposite angles. So, I can see that by the AAA test of uh, uh, similarity, I can see that A, uh, triangles ACM will be similar to triangle that is uh, triangle DBM. So, from this I can infer that AD, AC by DB uh, AC by uh, DB is equal to CM by BM is equal to AM by DM. Now, if I multiply this with this, so I will just try to show that. If I multiply cross multiply like this, I get CM into DM is equal to AM into BM. So, that is basically the property I have given over here. So, you can either remember this property or you can infer this from the fact that these two uh, triangles will be similar triangles. So, the reason why I am inferring these properties is that if in case there are a lot of things to remember in geometry as such. So, in case you do not remember things, always make sure that you are like uh, able to infer them with the help of similar triangles. As I said, similar triangles, congruent triangles are extremely powerful tools as such. They can help you in inferring properties and solving questions even when you do not have a lot of uh, prior knowledge about uh, properties uh, uh, like specific chord properties, tangent properties, etc. So, those kind of tools will help you even in that case. So, these are the basic chord properties that you should remember. Now, let us go to tangent properties. So, uh, let me first tell you what a basic uh, this of a tangent is. A tangent is a line that touches the circle at only one point. So, if this is the circle and this is of radius uh, r, then the line P T essentially will be tangential to the circle because it touches the circle exactly at one point that is T. The basic uh, this of the this is that the tangent uh, line uh, tangent is always perpendicular to the radius of the circle. So, if you join this uh, uh, point T to the center of the circle, then this uh, particular OT will be perpendicular to the line, tangent of the circle. So, this angle will be a right angle triangle. So, uh, based on this, I can also infer. So, if I know the first property, I will try to infer the remaining properties out of it. So, if I know this, the second property says that the See, suppose I draw these tangents from the same common point A. So, AT is one and AS is the other tangent. So, from this property, I can see that these two are essentially two right angle triangles. This distance from the uh, between the center of the circle and the external point is D and these two are radii. So, from the RHS property of congruency, I can infer that these two triangles are congruent to each other. From the fact that these two triangles are congruent to each other, these two lines should be equal. Therefore, the two tangents drawn from the same external point should be equal in length. So, from the fact that the tang uh, tangent is perpendicular to radius and from congruency of triangles, I can infer the second property that is two tan tangents drawn from the same external point of the uh, circle are equal in length. Now, let us come to the third uh, this. The third this is that uh, third property is that the angle uh, angle subtended by a chord at the uh, 
uh, so this is say the chord this is the center of the circle this is chord a b so what this property says that is that this if suppose this is a so if this is x uh, degrees then the angle subtended by chord a b in the uh, alternate segment so this is called alternate segment theorem so this ang if this angle is x degrees then the angle subtended by chord a b in the alternate segment so say that is a c b will also be x degrees now it is a very easy for you to infer this firstly you know that this is 90 degrees so o a is 90 degree uh, is at right angles to this uh, say a t so by that you can know that this is 90 minus x now if this is 90 minus x this is an isosceles triangle this is r this is r so this is also 90 minus x so this is 2x now if the angle subtended at the center is 2x then the angle subtended in the major segment will be x so from this basic thing you can infer that the angle subtended by a chord and a tangent is equal to the angle subtended by the chord in the alternate segment so if you can just draw it out you can infer the value of this angle as well now there is another last property uh, this is especially useful whenever you are given uh, the values of secants and tangents as such so what is a secant a secant is a line that intersects a circle at more than one point when it intersects a circle at exactly one point it is a tangent so suppose p is uh, this it will touch the circle at exactly one point and it is a tangent if it intersects the uh, circle at more than one point that is two points it is a secant so this is pm and n this is pa and b so what does the uh, this rule say this says that uh, pa into pb that is the product of this length into the product of this length will be equal to pn into pn will be equal to pt square so whenever you are asked to determine the length of uh, any part length of any secant like uh, in this case mn is the chord so what uh, what is often asked is what is the length of this chord and you are given the length of the tangent so using the uh, the length of the tangent using the length of this value you can then infer what the uh, length of the chord should be so that is whenever you are asked either for the length of the chord or length of the tangent this is a very useful formula to use in that case now let's go on to coordinate geometry so coordinate geometry is a kind of a building block uh, it encompasses even some aspects of uh, triangles and circles as such uh, we will first, uh, first discuss the basic properties of uh, coordinate geometry and then look at uh, specific applications of it in terms of triangles and circles. So uh, the first thing that we will uh, discuss is the distance formula. So in coordinate geometry this is defined as the x axis, this is the y axis and like suppose there are two points x1, y1, this is x2, y2. Then the distance between these two points is defined as by the distance formula as square root of uh, y2 minus y1 the whole square plus x2 minus x1 the whole square. So essentially if you think of it if I uh, the distance between these two points is essentially the line joining them and since these are the coordinates uh, x1 x2 minus x1 is this length and y2 minus y1 is this length. And by using Pythagoras theorem because this will be a right angle triangle because uh, essentially I am drawing parallel to x axis and parallel to y axis. So this angle will be a right angle triangle. So the distance between them will be uh, you can derive it by Pythagoras theorem as x2 minus x1 the whole square plus y2 minus y1 the whole square the square root of that. So this is the basic distance formula that we need to use whenever we have to find uh, the distance between any two coordinates as such. Now uh, we come to the basic equation of a line. So the basic equation of a line that I often use is y is equal to mx plus c. Here m is the slope of the line and c is the y intercept. Now what do you understand by slope of the line? So any line if you draw it like this, it will make an angle with the positive x axis. This is theta. So m is essentially tan of theta. So when m is positive, it means that uh, this tan theta is positive so the angle theta must be less than 90 degrees so it the line will be of this sort when uh, say theta is 90 that is that line is parallel to the y axis and then slope is not defined so the slope is undefined because tan theta is undefined for that point and when uh, theta is greater than 90 degrees the slope is negative so whenever you see the equation of a line where y is equal to 3x plus c you can uh, mentally picture a line which is like this where uh, 
it might be like this, it might be like this, it might be anything. But the point is that it will be sloping like this. When you see that y is equal to minus 3x plus c, you have to realize that the line will be like this, where it will be sloping in this direction. Uh, it's very important for you to visualize the line because it is often the first part where you have to draw the graph. And while drawing the graph, if you are able to visualize based on the y-intercept and the slope of the line, then it makes solving a lot easier. So that is basically the slope of the line. So the y-intercept is the point at which the line crosses the y-axis. So if this line crosses the y-axis over here, this would be the y-intercept. So you can say that this is 0, comma c. So this is the general form of the line. So now you're, if you're given like say two points on the line, how do you find out the slope of the line? So if x1, uh, x1 and x1, y1 and x2, y2 are two points on the line, then the slope of the line is y2 minus y1 upon x2 minus x1. This you can just infer from the fact that if a point lies on the line, then it should satisfy the equation of the line. So if I, this is equation 1, this is equation 2, if I subtract uh, 1 from 2, I get y2 minus y1 is equal to m times x2 minus x1. Then I, if I take this in the uh, denominator, I get m is equal to y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. So that is basically how you find out the slope of the line. Uh, this is the basic formula for determining the equation of the line given its uh, 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 given two points on the line. Uh, so this is the slope of the line. As I said, y-intercept is the point at which it crosses the y-axis. If you just substitute x is equal to 0, you will get the, in the given equation of the line, you will get the y-intercept of the line. So that is the uh, funda behind the uh, uh, slope of the line. Now that you know the equation of the line, I will uh, move on to the concept of distance between, uh, so we have discussed distance between two points. Now we will discuss distance between a point and a line. So suppose there is a point like this and there is a line like this. So how do you figure out the distance between the point and the line? So distance between the point and the line is this length of the perpendicular drop from this point to this line as such. So to figure out this uh, value, uh, sorry I missed a key point. So as, you say, as I said this is uh, the slope of the line. One thing you should remember of the, about the slope of the line is that uh, the slope of two parallel lines will be equal. The slope of two perpendicular lines, the product of two slopes of two perpendicular lines will be equal to minus 1. So if you see that this, uh, if this is uh, say y is equal to 3x plus 4 and y is equal to 3x plus 10, these two lines have the same slope. So they will be parallel lines. On the other hand, if this is a uh, uh, if you have y is equal to 3x plus 4 and you have 3y is equal to minus x plus 4, then as you can see that uh, the slope will be minus 1 by 3 and the product of these two slopes will be minus 1. So these two lines will be perpendicular to each other. So this is the basic concept behind uh, slope of uh, behind par parallel lines and perpendicular lines. Uh, for lines that are parallel to the x-axis, you will just have it of the form y is equal to k. For lines that are parallel to the y-axis, they will be of the form x is equal to some constant value. So now that you understand the concept of uh, equation of a line, let's go on to the concept of distance between a point and a line. So as I said, suppose this is a point x1, y1 and this is a uh, equation which is y is equal to mx plus c. To find the distance of this point from this line, you just first plug in this value into the equation. So the distance is given by, because distance is uh, uh, a positive value always, we take modulus, modulus of y1 minus mx1 minus c. So this is essentially the value that is left over when I plug in these values x1, y1 in the equation of the line. This divided by square root of 1 plus m square. Here m is the uh, slope of the line. This is the distance of a point from the line. Now what is the distance between two parallel lines? If there is another parallel line going like this, which is y is equal to mx plus c2 uh, and this is c1, then the distance between these two parallel lines is basically d2 is equal to c2 minus c1, the modulus of that divided by square root of 1 plus m square. So as you can see in both cases, we divide by square root of 1 plus m square. In this case, we plug in the value we get after putting in x1, y1 in the equation of the line. And in this case, we take the uh, modulus of the difference of the y-intercepts. So this is the basic fundamental while calculating the distance of a point or a, uh, distance of a point from a line or the distance between two parallel lines as such. So the distance between two parallel lines will be the 
length of this uh, line as such. So this is the basic formula that we have to remember. Uh, in addition to this, we need to remember in coordinate geometry the concept of internal and external angle bisector. So let me just make some space for that first. Um, so I'll just clear up some space so that I can write out the fundamentals of internal and external bisectors. Okay, so the concept of internal and external bisector is that suppose there is a line AB and a point M divides the line AB uh, say in the ratio M is to N and this is X1, Y1, this is X2, Y2, then MX that is the X coordinate of M can be uh, obtained by saying MX2 plus NX1 divided by M plus N. This is essentially a weighted uh, kind of a weighted average of the x and y coordinates except you have to cross the uh, multiplication m into x2 n into x1. Similarly, my is equal to my2 plus ny1 divided by m plus n. So, this is the x and y coordinates of a point that divides a line uh, in the ratio m is to n. Now, suppose m divides a b in the line externally. So, what do I mean externally? So, this is a b and m lies outside over here in such a way that a m by b m is equal to m by n. In this case, I would say that, so this is m by n. In this case, m x is equal to m x 2 minus n x 1 divided by m minus n and m y is equal to m y 2 minus n y 1 divided by m minus n. So, this is extremely useful in calculating coordinates whenever you are given uh, that some uh, point divides a line in uh, an odd ratio like 5 is to 3. Always remember the internal and external bisector theorem. Always think that okay, I can then find out the coordinates of that point using this internal and external bisector theorem and uh, once I have the coordinates and then I can find the length using the distance formula or some other method. So, that is the basic thing that you should uh, immediately get to whenever you see certain wordings in the question. Whenever you see that some point divides a line in a particular ratio, you should think of the bisector theorems. Whenever you see that um, some there are two parallel lines and the, you are asked the distance between them, then you should think of the distance formula that I just mentioned. So, these are important concepts that you should be at your recall immediately whenever you see questions on coordinate geometry. Now, we look at specific things that we have to remember in coordinate geometry that apply to triangles and circles as such. So, uh, as I had mentioned, centroid is the point at which uh, the medians of the triangles intersect. And I had said that the centroid divides the triangle into three equal halves. So, there is an easy formula to calculate the x and y coordinates of the centroid as well. So, suppose the x and y coordinates of A, B, C are x1, y1, x2, y2 and x3, y3. Then the x coordinate of the centroid will be x1 plus x2 plus x3 divided by 3. The y coordinate would be x1 plus x2 plus x uh, sorry y1 plus y2 plus y3 divided by 3. So, essentially it is the arithmetic mean of the x coordinates and the arithmetic mean of the y coordinates. For the incenter also we have an easy formula to calculate the coordinates of the incenter. So, for the same triangle ABC, this is the incenter. So, Ix is equal to and these are the lengths of the sides A, B and C. Then uh, the uh, x coordinate is basically a weighted average. Here you just had x1 plus x2 plus x3. Here you have to weight the average with the length of the side. So, it will be A x1. So, if this is x1 y1. So, you have to take the length of the side opposite to that vertex. This is x2 y2 and this is x3 y3. Then you take the length opposite to this. So, this is b x 2 plus c x 3 divided by a plus b plus c. So, this is kind of a weighted average weighted by the length of the sides opposite to that vertex. And i y is equal to a y 1 plus a y 2 b y 2 plus c y 3 divided by a plus b plus c. So, this is the basic formula for in center and circum center. So, why is this important? This is important at times because uh, it might not be explicitly mentioned to you that something is situated in coordinate geometry. They might not give you coordinates of the points and all. But suppose if you know the uh, uh, lengths or the, uh, uh, suppose you know certain lengths, 
uh, like say that you know that BC is equal to 10 centimeters or the height of uh, or some specific area such that you can easily determine x1 y1 x2 y2 and x3 y3 then to find out uh, the point G it might be easier to use a coordinate formula because here you just have to take an arithmetic mean once you have uh, used this you can then easily find out the arithmetic uh, like the x and y coordinates for G and then use that to find out the any specific length from like G to A or G to C etc. So always keep thinking that if you are using centroid you can use the coordinate geometry formula for x and y coordinates of centroids. Similarly, if you have an in-center, you can use this formula easily to find the x and y coordinates of the in-center. Another formula that we have to remember, as I said, there is a coordinate uh, geometry formula for area of a triangle. This formula is basically half times the determinant. So 1, 1, 1, x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3. So if the vertices of the triangle are x1, y1, x2, y2 and x3, y3, the area of the triangle is given by this determinant. In case somebody does not remember how to calculate the value of a determinant, so you basically say half into, so here we say this 1 into x2 y3 this side minus x3 y2. This times, uh, so I will put this, this times 1 plus 1 times x3 y1, so you put like this, x3 y1 in minus x1 y3. plus 1 times x1 y2 so like this minus x2 y1 so so this is the basic formula for the area of the triangle uh, another thing that you have to remember this is the uh, this is when the triangle vertices are x1 y1 x2 y2 x3 y3 now how do you use coordinate geometry when it comes to circle well, the equation of the circle in coordinate geometry is basically uh, of this form where there you have x square plus y square uh, and you do not have any x y term. Uh, so if you do not have any x y term and you have an x square term and you have a y square term uh, and you have some constant value and like you can have x values and you can have y values and some constant value then this equation will be the equation of a circle. You have to then represent this equation in the form of x minus h the whole square plus y minus k the whole square is equal to r square. Here r will be the radius and h comma k will be the uh, uh, coordinates of the center of the circle. So suppose your equation is x square plus 6x plus y square plus 8y. So I can write this is equal to 0. So I can write this as x square plus 6x plus 9 plus y square plus 8y plus 16 is equal to 25. So I have added 9 and uh, 16 to the LHS, I will have to add 9 and 16 to the RHS to get 25. So x square plus 6x x plus 9 is nothing but uh, x plus 3 square and uh, y square plus 8y plus 16 is nothing but y plus 4 the whole square. So this is equal to r square that is 5 square. So from this I can say that the radius is 5 and the center of the circle is at minus 3 comma minus 4. So always remember for a circle you need x square term, you need y square term. Uh, but and you should not have an x y term in it. So once you have that kind of an equation in x and y you can then change it to uh, this form to get uh, x square uh, plus x minus h the whole square plus y minus k the whole square is equal to r square equation and that is the equation of a circle. So this is the basic concepts of coordinate geometry as applied to circles and triangles. So now let us move on to the concept of quadrilaterals. So the basic uh, this uh, quadrilateral is any uh, close figure with four sides. So the basic area, uh, for area formula for a quadrilateral is a quadrilateral's area is basically half into the length of the diagonal. So in this case the diagonal is BD into the sum of the offsets. So suppose this offset is x1, so height of this uh, offset and this x2. So this area is equal to x1 plus x2. So this is basically an extension of the logic of area of triangles area of ADB is half into x1 into BD and ABDC is half into x2 into BD. So add them up together and you get the area of the triangle as this. So the area of any quadrilateral is half into length of the diagonal into the sum of the offsets of, of the other vertices from that diagonal, perpendicular offsets of the other two vertices from that diagonal. Now this is for any quadrilateral. Now we will 
discuss specific uh, types of quadrilaterals. So, we have the basic quadrilateral that uh, everybody will be uh, uh, familiar with is that is a square. In a square all the internal angles are 90 degrees and all the lengths are same. In this case uh, the area of the square is uh, L square and the perimeter is 4L. In case, <coughs> in case of all quadrilaterals perimeter is basically the sum of all sides. So, once you define the sides you will be able to define what the perimeter is. So, I would not be going much into the perimeter because it is essentially the sum of all sides as long as you remember that that is enough. Uh, uh, the area of uh, 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 this is uh, uh, L square that is product of the sides of the square. Uh, the second type of a quadrilateral that you see regularly is a rectangle. So, suppose this is ABCD. In this the um, <coughs> internal angles will be 90 degrees and uh, all the four lengths need not be the same. Uh, two lengths will be same and the, the op or two opposite lengths will be equal. So, in this case the area is equal to L length into breadth. So, the essential condition that I have relaxed over here is that all four lengths should be the same. Now, suppose if I relax uh, the condition for 90 degrees as well, but I still require that the sides be parallel to each other. In this case, I get a parallelogram of this sort. So, this is A, B, C, D. In this case, this angle is equal to this angle, this angle is equal to this angle. This, these two angles are supplementary angles essentially. So, if this is x, this is 180 minus x. And uh, <coughs> this uh, essentially these sides will be parallel to each other, the sides will be parallel to each other. So, in this I have relaxed the condition for them internal angles to be 90 degrees. The area of a pa uh, parallelogram is basically equal to base into height. So, in this case that is suppose uh, CD is the base and H is the height of the uh, perpendicular drop from B to CD extended, then this is equal to CD into H. Now, it is easy to understand why that is the case because if you split up this triangle in along the diagonal, BDC will be half into H into CD. Similarly, ABC will be half into AB into H. So, AB is equal to CD. So, essentially uh, this both triangles are equal uh, halves of the parallelogram. So, the area of the parallelogram is 2 into CD into H, uh, 2 into half into CD into H or rather CD into H. So, the area of a parallelogram is base into height. Or uh, we can also say that uh, since we have the area of a triangle is half AB sin C, so we can also say that area is equal to uh, if A and B are the two sides of the triangle, then we can say that area of a parallelogram is half AB into sin C, where uh, sin C is the included angle between the two sides as such. This is for a parallelogram. Now, if suppose I add is restricting uh, condition to a parallelogram saying that the internal angles need not be 90, but the side should be equal, then I get a rhombus. So, in this case, the other conditions of a parallelogram stay the same that is the two sides are parallel, the uh, angles are uh, uh, supplementary, this will be x, this is 180 minus x and all four sides will be again L. In this case, uh, in case of a rhombus kite and a square, the diag uh, diagonals of the this uh, cross intersect each other at right angles. So, if this uh, the length of first diagonal is d1 and the length of second diagonal is d2, this d1 and d2 are uh, uh, by, uh, intersect each other at right angles. In the case of a square, they, perpend uh, they are perpendicular bisectors of each other that is they bisect each other at right angles, same is the case with rhombus, they bisect each other at right angles. Uh, uh, the, uh, in the case of a square, they are equal also, uh, the two diagonals will be equal. In the case of a rhombus, they will not be equal. Uh, in the case of a kite, uh, one of the diagonals, so in, a kite is basically of this form, where the, your two diagonals are of this, they are uh, intersect at right angles. This length is equal to this length, this length is equal to this length. Uh, one of the diagonals is bisected, the other diagonal is not. So, this is A, B, C, D. So, in all these three cases that is rhombus, square and kite, the area is given by half into the product of the lengths of the diagonals that is half into D1 into D2. Uh, this is because uh, if I see this uh, formula that is half into diagonal length of diagonal into offsets of the diagonal. 
from that if the diagonals are intersecting at perpendicular uh, uh, are perpendicular to each other intersect each other at right angles the offsets will basically be collinear and then that will just be equal to the length of the diagonal as such whenever the diagonals intersect each other at right angles the area of the quadrilateral will be half into d1 into d2 now uh, for rhombus chiton square the uh, diagonals uh, intersect each other at right angles but not all uh, uh, diagonals that intersect each other at right angles are necessarily this so uh, it is not a necessary and sufficient condition as such but if you have a rectangle and the diagonals uh, uh, intersect each other at a right angle then it will be a square if you have a parallelogram and the diagonals intersect each other at right, right angles it will be a rhombus so these are the basic things that you should remember in a uh, quadrilaterals now let's go on to the concept of uh, in a parallelogram there's an additional uh, uh, this that you should remember that is if this is a b c d uh, and a c and b d are the uh, diagonals of a b c d then uh, the sum of squares of two adjacent sides so say a b square plus b c square uh, so is, this is twice the a b square plus b c square is equal to the sum of the squares of the diagonals that is a c square plus b d square so whenever you are asked about uh, the sum of squares of diagonals or lengths of diagonals or the square the length of diagonal always remember this one particular property as i had mentioned in the earlier this that in a rhombus uh, the diagonals by uh, intersect each other at right angles and they also bisect each other so this is d1 by 2 and this is d1 by 2 and this is at 90 degrees and this will be d2 by 2 and this is d2 by 2 and these four sides are of equal length so if you consider this particular triangle this is l this is d1 by 2 this is d2 by 2 and this is 90 degrees so by pythagoras theorem i can say that l square is equal to d1 by 2 the whole square plus d2 by 2 the whole square so the length of one side of a rhombus is equal to square root of half of uh, the one diagonal length of one diagonal square plus half of second uh, diagonal square so this is the basic properties about parallel grams and rhombus the last quadrilateral we will take a look at is a cyclic quadrilateral cyclic quadrilateral is a quadrilateral whose uh, vertices lie on the circumference of a circle so that is a b c d in a cyclic quadrilateral the opposite sides are complement uh, supplementary to each other so if that is x this is 180 minus x this is y then this is 180 minus y that is the basic concept of a, quad, a cyclic quadrilateral another property of a cyclic quadrilateral is if this is a b c d and semi perimeter is basically a plus b plus c plus d by 2 then the area of the cyclic quadrilateral will be s into s minus uh, square root of s minus a into s minus b into s minus c into s minus d uh, also another thing that you can remember is the Ptolemy's theorem so whenever you are asked about the lengths of cyclic quadrilaterals you can say that uh, AB into uh, so uh, pairs of opposite sides so AB into CD plus AD into BC will be equal to product of the diagonals so that is AC into BD so this is called Ptolemy's theorem. So whenever you have uh, diagonals or a cyclic quadrilateral and you are required to find the length of any particular side, remember this one theorem. So this is the basic fundamentals of quadrilaterals. Let us move on to polygons. I uh, will just cover the basic uh, idea behind polygons. Uh, so first thing a polygon is any n sided closed figure. So sorry. So suppose uh, you have six sides. So this is a, uh, this is a convex polygon because uh, of uh, six sides. So what's a convex polygon? A convex polygon is any polygon uh, from which uh, if you draw a line, it can cut a polygon at a max of two points. So here it is, here and here. So essentially it does not have, uh, can't draw a line that will uh, that will cut the polygon at more than two points. You can draw a line such that it cuts the polygon only at one point, like say here like this along the edge or vertex or something like that. But you can't draw a line that it cuts it at more than two points. So this is a convex polygon. Now what is a concave polygon? A concave polygon is a polygon where you can draw a line such that it cuts the uh, polygon at more than two points. So in this case you can cut this line will is cutting the polygon at four points. So this is a concave polygon. So most of the times we will be discussing convex polygons. 
uh, when I say a regular polygon, it essentially means that uh, it is a n-sided figure where all n sides are equal in length and all internal ang uh, equal sides and all internal angles are equal. So, mostly our discussion will be limited to this because this is what is mostly asked in the uh, uh, CAT exam as such. So, a regular hexagon is a six sided polygon with where all six sides are equal and all internal angles are also equal. A regular pentagon is a five sided figure where all five, five, five sides are equal. A regular four sided figure quadrilateral will be a square. A regular three sided figure will be an equilateral triangle. Uh, so, after that you have uh, a hexagon, uh, you have like a heptagon, octagon, etc. So, there is like no end to that. So, these are all the disc, uh, points that I am going to discuss now apply mostly to regular polygons as such. Uh, all of them apply only to convex co polygons. So, always remember this part. So, uh, <clears throat> in a uh, basic property of a polygon is that, so say I will uh, first draw a uh, hexagon just for reference so that it is easy to understand what I am saying. So, in a uh, regular convex polygon, the interior angle plus ex exterior angle will be equal to 180 degrees because suppose this is x, then this will be 180 minus x. So, this is the first property. This is essentially a simple property for you to remember, not specific to polygons also as such. The basic property, you will try to remember these properties by trying to remember uh, a minimum set of properties and infer the other properties from that. The basic property that you should remember is that the exterior sum of all exterior angles of a polygon is 360 degrees. So, this angle plus this angle plus this angle plus this angle all of these should be equal to 360 degrees. Now, why is this the case? So, if you think of it, you are kind of moving around a circle till you come to the same point again. So, you are doing a full 360 degrees turn around a circle. So, the sum of all of these angles will be equal to 360 degrees. This is the basic equation that you need to remember. So, if all of these are 360 degrees and it is an n sided regular polygon, then it, uh, in an n sided regular polygon, all internal angles are equal. So, all exterior angles will be equal. If all exterior angles are equal and the sum of all exterior angles is 360 degrees, each exterior angle will be 360 by n. So, each exterior angle of a regular n sided polygon is 360 by n. If that is 360 by n, then the interior angle for a regular three, uh, n sided polygon will be. Uh, so, essentially if that is 360 by n, uh, this will be uh, 180 minus 360 by n. So, that is essentially 180 n minus 360 by n. Each internal angle will be this value. So, the each internal angle of a regular n sided polygon will be 180 n minus 360 the whole divided by n. So, I got this by just remembering this fact that the sum of all exterior angles is 360 degrees. If each interior angle of a regular n sided polygon is this, so the sum of all interior angles will be just this into n. So, this will be 180 n minus 360 degrees. So, just from that one fact I could uh, infer 3, 4, 5 and 6. So, just remember the fact that sum of all exterior angles is 360 degrees. So, uh, now, uh, now that I have uh, this fact, uh, I can also infer that since the interior angle is 180, uh, the sum of this is 180 n minus uh, 360 and the sum of all exterior angles is 360, I can infer that if I take 180 in common from numerator and denominator, this is n minus 2 by 2. So, the ratio of uh, interior angle to exterior angle is essentially n minus 2 to 2. Uh, so, the, in a regular polygon, the ratio of internal angle to exterior angle is n minus 2 to 2. So, I have gotten all of this information just from the fact that the sum of all exterior angles is 360 degrees. Now, the area of a regular polygon. So, essentially, in a regular polygon, uh, instead of figuring out all of that, what you should just do is that uh, you should split each regular polygon into n pa equal parts. And you have now a triangle and you have n equal triangles of that sort. So, in this triangle, so you know that uh, this is, uh, this angle is x degrees, this angle outside it is uh, 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 180 minus x. Now, this, uh, this will be equal. So, these two are equal triangles. So, this will be essentially x by 2, this will be x by 2. So, this will be essentially 180 minus x because the sum is uh, this. So, on the, on the using this basic uh, uh, fundamental, uh, so, the in an exterior sorry I uh, I actually made uh, this. Uh, so, I know that the exterior angle for a uh, regular n sided polygon is uh, 360 by n. 
this is 360 by n i know that this is 180 uh, uh, one, uh, 180 n minus 360 by n so the this each of each this part so that is this part plus this part is 180 n minus 360 by n so this part alone would be half of that so that is 180 n minus 360 by n uh, by 2n so that is essentially uh, if i just uh, uh, remove the this this is essentially 90 minus uh, uh, 180 uh, sorry 180 by n so this is this part this is 90 minus 180 by n this is 90 minus 180 by n so this angle which at the uh, center of the this would be essentially uh, <coughs> this will be 180 minus 90 min plus 180 by n minus 90 plus 180 by n so i get essentially 360 by n so at the end of the day i get a simple isosceles triangle of this form let's say this length is s which is basically the length from the center of the regular polygon to the vertex so this is x i got uh, i derived that this is 360 by n so this is 360 by n so i know the formula for area of a triangle is uh, uh, half into uh, so the enclosing sides are s and s so s square into sin 360 by n and there are n such triangles so that is n into uh, uh, this will be the area of the entire regular polygon so instead of remembering uh, uh, the uh, individual values you can uh, just infer them by using the common fact that the sum of all exterior angles is 360 degrees uh, of all the of all the polygons the most important polygon to essentially remember is hexagon because it features the most uh, uh, most often in uh, cat in case of a hexagon this will be an equilateral triangle and this length will be equal to this length will be equal to this length so whatever is the length of the side of the hexagon all three sides will be the same this will be 60 degrees so essentially this becomes uh, there are six equilateral triangles so six by two into side of the uh, hexagon in side of the hexagon square into sine uh, 60 so this is root 3 by 2 so i have uh, 6 root 3 by 4 times s square so as i see 6 root 3 by uh, root 3 by 4 s square is the uh, area of an equilateral triangle 6 times uh, the area of an equilateral triangle is the area of the hexagon so from this i can infer the area of a regular polygon by using this basic concept now let's uh, the last concept that we have to remember is the number of triangles in a uh, n sided polygon so the number of diagonals in a n sided polygon is suppose this is your uh, sorry uh, if suppose this is your polygon as such so for you to form a diagonal you need to connect it to a point that it is not already connected to so for each point uh, you will have uh, for this point there are uh, n uh, there are uh, the remaining points are n minus 1 but it is already connected by edges to two of these points so the number of points that it can be connected to is n minus 1 minus 2 so n minus 3 such points exist so for n each n of these points there are n minus 3 points that can be connected to it in the form of diagonals but when you are doing this you are kind of double counting so when i am counting this i am counting this point again also so i am double counting each diagonal so i have to divide by 2 so the number of diagonals of a n sided polygon is n into n minus 3 divided by 2 so this is the last property I have to remember for polygons. Now let's come to solids. So solids, uh, let's uh, first cover the surface area and then the volume. So let's cover the what the basic solids are. This is cube, this is cuboid, this is a prism and this is a pyramid. This is a sphere, this is a uh, cylinder, this is a cone and this is a frustum. This is a conical frustum because uh, this is formed by cutting off the top part of a cone. So cube is basically uh, has all six faces which are equal uh, in the, this all uh, dimensions of the cube are equal. The volume of the cube is uh, L cube where L is the length of the side and uh, the um, so sorry first I am discussing surface area. So since there are six faces that is six into the of uh, uh, area of one's uh, face and this is the square basically so that is l square so a cuboid is basically a rectangle in a 3d form so basically its surface area will be uh, there are uh, two uh, uh, so suppose this is length this is breadth and this is height so there are two uh, two rectangles of each type so there is one rectangle here that is length into height there is one rectangle here that is breadth into height 
and there is one rectangle here that is length into breadth. So, there are two such faces for each of them. So, the surface area is 2 into length into breadth plus breadth into height plus length into height. That is the surface area. In a prism, basic a prism is basically it can be any type of prism. It can be hexagonal prism, triangular prism, anything basically. But the basic thing in a, a prism is that uh, it is uh, the uh, standing faces are rectangles. So, you have a triangle at the bottom, triangle at the top and then rectangular faces on the sides. So, in the uh, prism, so these are rectangles. So, this is base of the prism. These are rectangles. So, the uh, surface area of the uh, standing part will be basically perimeter of this triangle into the height of the prism. And the total surface area will be 2 times the uh, base area. So, if I add that, I get the total surface area of the prism. Now, in case of a pyramid, uh, there is a square at the bottom and there are triangular sides, four triangular sides. So, for this, I basically have to consider the base area first plus I have to add the uh, slant height. So, essentially, this is the base area, this uh, is the perimeter of the base. Now, the perimeter of the base and this is the slant height of the triangle. So, the slant half into slant height into this length base will be the area of this particular triangle. Now, if I consider all four sides as such, uh, the bases add up together to give me the perimeter of the base as such. So, I get surface area as base area of the pyramid plus perimeter of the base into half into slant height. Uh, be careful, the slant height is essentially uh, like uh, from the apex a perpendicular drop to the base over here. So, this will be the midpoint uh, and uh, so, uh, this will be essentially a perpendicular drop from this vertex to this this. So, if you have this triangular face, if you flatten it out and you drop the altitude from the vertex, that would be the slant height of the uh, this. The slant height is not the this vertical height, that is not the height of the pyramid. The slant height is the height of the uh, uh, triangle that is uh, there as such. So, that is pyramid. Uh, the sphere, the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r square. For a cylinder, so the thing that you should remember is this uh, cylinder is essentially has circle, circle, circles as such. Each cross section is a circle. So, the circumference of the circle, uh, h times the height times circumference of the circle is the curved surface area of the cylinder. So, the curved surface area of the cylinder is pi r square, uh, uh, sorry, 2 pi r. Uh, that is the circumference into h that is the curved surface area plus 2 pi r square that is the base area of the bottom plus the top will give me the total surface area. For a cone, I have to first consider pi r square which is the surface area of the bottom. This is r say. Then I have to consider this is the radius, this is the slant height. So, slant height is basically the if I put a uh, string on the top or the apex and uh, take the string to the edge or, or the base of the this just a straight line that would be L and this is suppose the height of the cone. So, essentially L square is equal to R square plus H square by Pythagoras theorem. This forms a right angle triangle as you can see. So, L square L is basically the slant height of the cone. So, the curved surface area of the cone is pi R L. So, the total uh, uh, surface area of the cone is pi R square plus pi R L. Now, let us come to the frustum of the cone. So, the frustum of the cone uh, generally, I prefer to calculate it by calculating the uh, surface areas of both the uh, uh, curved surface areas of the bigger cone minus the smaller cone and then add the two surface areas of the circle. But you can uh, remember a shorthand uh, way of remembering the surface area for the frustum itself. That is essentially first the pi r, in this case pi r 1 square plus pi r 2 square that is for this area and the uh, larger circles uh, base area. Those areas are that uh, and uh, for the curved surface area. So, suppose uh, this is the sl slant height along the frustum. So, this is just the slant height along this part of frustum that is remaining. If that is the case, then I have that part as pi s into r1 plus r2. So, that gives me the surface area of the frustum. So, I will write it again. I think it is not clear over here. So, let me write that again pi r1 square plus pi r2 square plus pi r1 pi s into r1 plus r2. So, this is the uh, surface curve surface area. Uh, this part is the curve surface area of the frustum. These are the two base areas as such. So, that is the basic uh, fundamental of uh, 
uh, area surface areas of solids now let's go on to volumes of solids so again the same thing for this is a cube so the volume of a cube is l cube where l is the side of the cube if length uh, breadth and height are the this then the volume is length into breadth into height for the triangular prism so any case you have a solid which has the same cross sectional area throughout the volume of that solid will be that cross sectional area into the height of the solid so in this case that is base area and in this case l is given as the height so that is base area into l in this case of a pyramid so in case the cross sectional area is constant as i said it is just that cross sectional area into the height in the case of uh, a tapering kind of a solid where the cross sectional area tapers to a point the volume is equal to 1/3 base area into height uh in case of a sphere the volume is 4 by 3 pi r square pi r cube in case of a cylinder again the cross section is a circle throughout so the area of the circle is pi r square so the volume is pi r square h now a cone is essentially if you take a cylinder this each cross section is a circle but it is tapering to a point so when it is tapering to a point we have 1/3 pi r square h a uh, first term i generally say volume of the un uncut uh, part minus the volume of the cut part or you can remember the shorthand in case uh, uh, in you, in case you want to save time that is 1/3 into pi into h here h is the height of the first term not the height of the entire cone or uh, this just half 1/3 into pi into h into r square uh, r1 square plus r2 square plus r1 r2 so this is the uh, volume of the first term this is a conical first term as i said this is generally uh, when they give first term they ask about conical first term only not uh, pyramidal first term and all so these are the basics of solids so now that we have covered almost all concepts of uh, geometry let's move on to arithmetic so arithmetic the first and the most important topic in arithmetic is time speed distance so the basic formula that you need to remember in time speed distance is speed is equal to distance upon time this is the primary formula that you have to remember everything else uh, you have to just uh, create an equation with uh, uh, speed is equal to distance upon time so all the basic questions in uh, uh, time speed distance you have to first identify whether the scenario being discussed is about constant time or the scenario discussed is about constant distance so if two things are traversing the same distance uh, at different speeds and taking different times then the uh, then the thing that they are traversing the problem is of a question of constant distance for example if somebody runs the same race at different speeds and uh, finishes it in different time then uh, because they are running on the same track they are covering the same distance then you basically have to uh, write a equation like s1 t1 is equal to s2 t2 uh, once you equate those two sides then you can find a relationship between them if they are covering the same common distance now suppose if they run for the same time and cover different distances like suppose uh, i start from a you start from b and we meet at some point in the middle uh, if i we start at the same point we'll be essentially traveling for the same time and the distance covered by us would be different but the time for which we uh, travel would be the same so this will be a question of constant time so in this case uh, we can say that uh, d1 by s1 will be equal to d2 by s2 so by using this equation then we can figure out how much of the distance was covered by this person how much of the distance was covered by the other person so essentially in time speed and distance just first figure out the scenario being discussed is of constant time or constant distance then write an equation in uh, speed uh, essentially using this con uh, basic formula of time speed and distance that's your only thing for most uh, easy questions in time speed and distance Uh, one concept of uh, this that you have to take uh, care of is that whenever you are asked average speed, do not calculate the average of the speeds given. You calculate average speed by first calculating what is the total distance, and you divide that by the total time. The reason for this is that uh, the average speed is dis different depending on whether the the speed is calculated over equal intervals of time or over equal distances. so because that is different uh, there are different formulas for calculating average in one case you have an arithmetic mean in another case you have a harmonic mean so forget all of that just remember that average speed is total distance by total time sorry 
So first you will have to calculate what is the total distance covered, what is the total time taken. Total distance by total time is the average speed. One quick uh, this that you need to remember is that speed whenever you are uh, whenever you are writing this equation make sure that you are consistent in your units. So if the speed is in kilometers per hour this should be in kilometers per hour kilometers and this should be in hours. If the speed is in meters per second, then this should be in meters, this should be in second. Uh, all the uh, units in the particular equation should be consistent. So suppose you have to convert from meters per second to kilometers per hour, just remember that speed in meters per second is 5 by 18 times speed in kilometers per hour. Okay. So that is the same uh, thing that you need to use to convert, uh, first convert everything in the same metric uh, meters, everything should be in meters, everything should be in seconds or and meters per second or everything should be in kilometers and hours. So always make sure you have consistent units. Then uh, the thing that uh, we will cover is circular tracks. So in circular tracks you need to remember the fact that if two people are running along a circular track, say uh, if uh, one person takes T A time to complete one uh, turn of the track and the other person running along the track takes TB time to complete uh, a uh, uh, round of the track, then they will meet at the starting point for the first time after LCM of TA, TB seconds. So uh, essentially what this means is that uh, the first runner will be at the starting point after TA seconds, after 2 TA seconds, 3 TA seconds and so on. So uh, second runner will be there at TB seconds, 3 t 2 TB seconds, 3 TB seconds and so on. So the first time both will be at the starting point will be the LCM of T A and T B. So that is when both will meet at the starting point for the first time. But this is not the first time they meet at all. This is the first time they are meeting at the starting point. To figure out when they meet for the first time, you have to figure out uh, essentially uh, we have to then consider the concept of how much time would it take for one of them to cover the entire length of the uh, uh, track. Uh, divided by the speed differential between them. So suppose if they are running in the same direction, then uh, suppose A is running faster than B, then essentially A has to complete the entire length of the track and uh, 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 sorry, so if he is going at SA and the other guy is going at SB, then the relative speed of A with respect to B will be SA and uh, will be SA uh, minus SB that uh, length of the track divided by SA minus SB will be the uh, time taken by A to complete one extra rotation as compared to B and then they will meet on the track. Now suppose they are running in opposite directions, if they are running in opposite directions they will essentially co complete the track at speeds, they will be moving towards each other. So we add the two velocities to each other, Cover this uh, the length of the track divided by the sum of the speeds will give you the time taken by them to meet for the first time. Now this is the, uh, the time taken by them to meet for the first time. Now you have to figure out where they will meet. So essentially uh, they can meet at end points along the uh, circumference of the circle. If they are moving, uh, so if this is SA and SB and it can be represented in X uh, as a ratio of X to Y which is the ratio in the lowest form. If they run in the same side then uh, if they run along in the same direction then the number of meeting points would be x minus y modulus of x minus y. If they run in opposite directions then the number of meeting points would be x plus modulus of x plus y. So essentially if I, uh, if, uh, I run at 4 meters per second and another person runs at 2 meters per second then the ratio of our speeds would be 2 is to 1. If we run in the same direction we will meet at one point along the circle that would be the same as the starting point. Uh, all your starting point will be one of the meeting points because I said uh, they will definitely meet at the starting point at LCM of TA and comma TB. So if there is one point that one point is the starting point. Uh, if we move in opposite directions the number of points would be three points. So we will move at three points along the circle. So one point would be the starting point, the other point would be one third along the circle, the third point would be two third along the circle and then the starting point would be the third point as such. So this is the basic fundamental of circular tracks. Now let's go on to the concept of relative velocity. I've kind of introduced it already, but let's take a uh, closer look at the concept. So essentially, whenever we define uh, velocity, we define it with respect to the frame of reference of the ground. So if I say that somebody is moving at four meters per second, what I mean is that he is moving at four meters per second with respect to the ground. But at times when two people are moving towards each other, 
it might more make more sense or make it easy for us to calculate if we consider things from the frame of reference of one of the people who is on one of the moving uh, elements so suppose a and b are moving towards each other then instead of saying that uh, okay this guy is moving with v a and this guy is moving with v b i assume that uh, i am uh, thinking of things from a's point of view so from a's point of view a is stationary like for example think of it like you are sitting on a train so for you when you are sitting in a train you are stationary the train is moving but relative to you uh, the train is stationary so for you uh, va the a is stationary and uh, what is approaching at you from like the opposite side is uh, running at va plus vb speed that is it uh, the sp your speed is added to that person speed so then b will be approaching you at speed va plus vb if somebody is standing on the platform that person is approaching you uh, at the speed of va so essentially you transfer your speed to other people if somebody is approaching you your that person speed becomes the, uh, their own speed plus va if somebody is uh, moving in the same direction as you their effective speed becomes suppose there is another person c moving in the same direction with speed vc then his effective speed will become vc minus va this is the basic concept of relative velocity so generally we use this in complicated questions with trains because suppose you have a uh, train a and you have train b and uh, there is one person on train a moving to the front of the train and one person on b moving to the rear of the train and all of these kind of complications then it becomes difficult to uh, calculate the speed of each of these uh, with respect to the ground it would make much more sense to consider one of these people to be stationary transfer their speed to uh, the other person and then calculate the effective speed at which that uh, person is moving towards this person then you can calculate using relative velocity much faster so we'll do this in terms of trains and boats and uh, escalators in the next slide so uh, the basic things that you need to remember in terms of trains is if uh, a train has to cross another train so if uh, so when i say two trains completely cross each other the end point of this train so this is start point 1 end point 1 this is start point 2 end point 2 when i say they are just starting to cross each other and they are moving in opposite directions i mean that start s1 and s2 are coincident and uh, for them to completely cross each other this point e2 uh, it should be kind of like this where e2 and e1 should be coincident with each other and s1 uh, s2 will be here and s1 will be here so for this to happen they have to kind of cover uh, the lengths of both of the trains so if this length is l1 this is l2 the and the speed of this is uh, 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 say v1 and this is v2 then the time taken for both trains to cross each other would, would be l1 plus l2 divided by v1 plus v2 now suppose they are moving in the same direction then in that case if they are just about to start crossing each other then this is s1 this is s2 they are coincident with each other this is suppose a shorter train l1 this is e1 uh, and this is the uh, other train that is l2 and this is e2 for the train s2 to completely cross s1 the length of the train and this is the faster train say v2 is greater than v1 the this is speed of uh, this and v2 is the speed of the second train so for train 2 to completely cross train 1 uh, it has to cover its own length essentially so essentially from here e2 has to come over here so it has to be like uh, e1 s1 e2 s2 so essentially the distance that has to be covered is the length of the own train so that is l2 and the relative velocity at which it will cover will be v2 minus v1 so that is the time taken by it to cross two trains to cross when they are moving in the same direction so this is the time taken when uh, they are moving in the same direction this is when they are moving in the opposite directions for boats the basic thing you have to remember is that uh, when a boat is moving upstream suppose the speed of the boat is b the speed of this speed of the boat is b the speed of the steam is s the velocity while moving upstream will be b minus s and the velocity while moving downstream will be b plus s so if a boat covers the same distance going up by, as well as coming down say the distance is d the time taken will be d divided by b minus s plus d divided by b plus s this is the total time taken so essentially you have to just remember the fact that effective speed going upstream is b minus s where b is the speed of the boat in still water s is the speed of the stream and going downstream is b plus s for escalators the only thing that you need to remember is that the number of steps taken by uh, 
the person plus the number of steps moved by the ex, um, number of step, steps moved by the escalator is equal to the total number of steps so essentially if uh, 30 steps are visible in the escalator and the escalator moves for like 5 seconds at 3 steps per seconds then the number of steps that the person must have had to take is 30 minus 15 that is the steps taken by the person would be 15 steps so you basically have to write this equation so that person takes 15 steps the escalator moves for 5 he takes 15 ste uh, he takes 15 steps in 5 seconds the escalator itself moves at 3 steps per second in that period so 3 steps per second into 5 seconds is 15 steps 15 steps plus 15 steps is the 30 steps that is the total length of the escalator as such this is the total number of visible steps this is the only equation that you need to remember when you are moving in the direction of the escalator the steps are added so it is number of steps of the person plus the number of steps of the escalator if the escalator is moving in the opposite direction then you have to just replace this by minus sign so i have to take uh, extra steps to compensate for the fact that the escalator is moving in the opposite direction that will be equal to the total number of steps now let's get on to the concept of time and work. In time and work, the only thing you basically have to remember is the concept of efficiency. So if A takes T A uh, days to do a work, B takes T B days to do a work, C takes T C days to do a work, you have to write the time taken by them to do a work in terms of their efficiency. So their daily efficiency is T by 1 by T A. So uh, A does T 1 by T A units of work per day T B does 1 by T B units of work every day and C does 1 by T C units of work every day when people work together we sum up their efficiency so I get 1 by T A plus 1 by T B plus 1 by T C as the combined efficiency so the trick here is always to make sure that you take the total number of units of work that has to be done as a uh, LCM of T A T B and T C so like just say for example A takes 5 days, B takes 4 days and C takes 6 days. In this case LCM of 5, 4 and 6 is essentially uh, 20 uh, into 3 uh, 60. So I have to basically uh, take uh, uh, 60 units of the work as the total amount of work to be done. If A takes 5 days to do 60 units of work, he does 12 units every day. Uh, B takes 4 un uh, days to do 60 units, so he does 15 units every day. C takes 6 days to do 60 units, so he does 10 units every day. So the total amount of work done by all three of, if all three of them work together in a day, they will do 27, 37 units of work. So the time taken by them to complete the, the entire work would be 60 by 37 days. So this is, that is the essentially 60 units divided by efficiency or the speed of doing things, that is 37 units per day, that is 60 by 37 days. So this is the basic fundamental of uh, time and work. Write down the efficiency of each person, uh, convert this efficiency into units, uh, take the total amount of work that has to be done as an LCM of the individual times taken, uh, uh, calculate uh, the efficiency of each of these person according to the total uh, by the LCM. So you will get an integral value if you take an LCM, add them up together if they work together. Uh, given the condition, so suppose A and B work together, then some A and B on that day. Uh, B and C work together the next day, then some B and C efficiencies together on that day and so on. So you will get the works done on each day, sum them up to find out when the work, entire work will be completed. That is the basic fundamental behind time and work. Now this thing can be, uh, essentially pipes and cisterns is an extension of this. Uh, so essentially uh, when you have to fill in a tank, the outlet can be considered as a person doing positive work, uh, inlet sorry, inlet can be considered as a uh, pipe doing positive work, positive work and an outlet is a uh, pipe doing negative work or has negative efficiency. So essentially uh, uh, when you have that uh, a pipe A uh, fills the tank in 8 hours, pipe B fills the tank in, uh, uh, this is inlet, this is inlet. Uh, fills it in 6 hours and pipe C empties it in uh, 10 hours. Then if all three of them are open together, you have to first take the LCM of this that is 8, 6 and 10. 
so the, you have uh, 8 into uh, 3 that is 23 20, uh, 240 say, uh, uh, sorry not 240 uh, 120 units so the lcm of these is 120 units so uh, 120 by uh, 8 so this does uh, 15 units per hour this does 20 units per hour and this uh, removes 12 units in an hour so in an hour the total amount that is added is 35 minus 12 that is uh, 23 units so basically in each hour i will be adding 23 units of water into the uh, tank where whose entire capacity is 120 units so the time taken by uh, for to fill the entire tank would be 120 units divided by 23 units per hour and then i'll get the number of hours that are required so this is the basic fundamental behind uh, calculating uh, how much time it is going to take to fill a tank how much time it is going to take to do some work convert uh, time taken into efficiency add together efficiency when people are doing positive work redu uh, remove like uh, take negative efficiency when there somebody thing is acting against it like an outlet pipe etc and uh, sum the efficiency combined efficiency uh, total work to be done divided by combined efficiency is the um, gives you the time taken so this is the basic fundamental behind time and work as such so now let's move on to the concept of uh, averages and percentages these are very fundamental concepts and easy to remember but they are essential that you know the formulas well average is basically an arithmetic mean so the average of n terms x1 x2 x3 till xn is basically divided as sum uh, so the average is equal to sum of x1 to xn divided by n the weighted average is equal to suppose the weights for each of these are w2 w1 w2 w3 till wn the weighted average is w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus and so on till wn xn divided by w1 plus w2 plus and so on till wn so this is uh, this is essentially a weighted average so why is a weighted average taken suppose you have a class where there are 20 girls and 30 boys and the average weight of girls is say 45 and the average weight of boys is say 55 then what would be the weighted average in this case in this case the weighted average would be the weight uh, that is assigned is the number of girls so that is 20 into 45 plus 30 into 55 divided by 20 plus 30 this will give you the total average of the number of people in the class so whenever you have groups of people you take a weighted average instead of taking a simple average as such percentages the concept of percentages i'm sure uh, everybody would be uh, uh, this so percentage change uh, uh, percent change is essentially final value minus initial value divided by initial value into 100% so this is the basic concept of percentage change uh, when you have two successive percentages changes for example x percent and y percent uh, the combined percentage change would be essentially x plus x plus y plus x y by 100 so for example if the value increases by x is say increases by 10 percent and then again increases by 20 percent the combined increase percentage change would be 10 plus 20 plus 10 into 20 by 100 so this is equal to uh, 2 so this is 32 percent so the combined increase in the value of the thing would be 32 percent so this is the basic fundamentals of averages and percentages you can expect one question from this and uh, being such an easy topic you should get all questions that come from this topic correctly so now let's go on to another simple topic that is ratio and proportion so the basic things that you need to understand in ratio and proportion is that uh, suppose a b c d are uh, positive integers so whenever we have uh, positive integers like this and say x is also a positive integer so uh, when a by b is a proper fraction what do i mean by a proper fraction a proper fraction is one that is less than one when a, uh, a uh, by b is a proper fraction then a plus x by b plus x will be greater than a by b when it is an improper fraction then a plus x by plus b plus x will be less than a plus b so this is the basic fundamental in ratio of proportion when you are to like compare ratios always make sure that you use this basic concept so if you have 11 by 5 and 13 by 7 11 by 5 will be greater than 13 by 7 similarly if you have 11 by 18 and 13 by 20 11 by 18 will be less than 13 by 20 
the importance of this has gone down with the use of uh, 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 re, uh, like a calculator but this uh, will still help you save some time in like things like di uh, uh, like data interpretation where you quickly compare values if you can see uh, if you are like used to understanding that uh, ratios work in this way you need not use a calculator to compare simple values like this uh, some basic concepts that are often used in ratio and proportion is that of componendo and dividendo so suppose a by b is equal to c by d then a plus this is also equal to a plus c divided by b plus d also this is equal to a plus b by b will be equal to c plus d by d a minus b by b will be equal to c minus d by d and a plus b divided by a minus b is equal to c minus c plus d divided by c minus d so this is the basic concept of componendo dividendo so these are the basic uh, building blocks of understanding ratios and proportion uh, so whenever you are given questions on ratio and proportion where if you are given like giant expressions is equal to some constant value try to use these concepts to reduce the complexity of expressions suppose at times might, what might happen is that if you add them together some of the terms might cancel and you would get a easier to work with expression and you will get a constant plus value over here k plus a and k minus a which is much easier for you to deal with than like a giant expression on your left hand side so this is where it, this would be useful uh, from relation proportion what generally comes is about mixtures and allegation so allegation is a quick way of finding out in what proportion two things must be mixed to find uh, a uh, mixture of a certain uh, quality so suppose you have a uh, uh, rice which uh, costs you 90 per kg and another rice which costs you 100 per kg in what ratio should you mix these two rice such that the given mixture uh, uh, costs 92 per kg now the quick way to do this is to write it in this way you draw this you write the required mean over here 92 per kg and you require inputs as one input over here other input over here just draw this figure quickly and then uh, this minus this that is 8 uh, and over here you write this minus this that is 2 so the required ratio of mixing is 8 is to 2 that is 4 is to 1 so you take 4 parts of the rice uh, uh, costing 90 per kg for one part of the rice weighing uh, uh, for the rice uh, 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 costing 100 per kg so this is the basic uh, idea behind uh, allegation so this is extremely useful for solving uh, answering questions uh, where you are asked in what ratio should these be mixed so that uh, this is the end result as such the other thing that you are often asked is of uh, solutions where in solutions you are given that uh, there is a certain initial concentration and uh, some part of this is removed so for example you have 100 liters of milk some part of this is removed and replaced with water so con let's consider the this that you have 100 liters of milk 10 liters is removed and replaced with water so now you have 90 liters of milk and uh, 10 liters of water again 10 liters of water is removed so you would now have and replace with 10 uh, under 10 liters of the solution is removed and replaced with 10 liters of water so 10 liters of the solution will have 9 liters of milk and 1 liter of water so this will be 81 liters of milk and uh, 9 liters of water and plus 10 liters of water is added to replace the quantity so this will be 19 liters of water essentially this will continue to sum up to 100 so you can always just remember that if I do this again operation then uh, I will be removing 8.1 from this so this will be 72.9 liters of milk and uh, the remaining uh, this would be over here that is 27.1 liters of water so I could keep doing this or there is an easy way to remember this so the final volume of the liquid that is not removed so in this case that is milk is equal to the initial volume initial volume into the quantity that is not removed I will just clear up things so that uh, it is easier for you to see quantity not removed divided by total volume removed or uh, total volume of uh, solution raised to n so in this case uh, final volume of milk after three iterations was here n is the number of iterations uh, number of times this thing is done so the initial volume was 100, li 100 liters of milk quantity not removed uh, 10 liters was removed out of a 100 liter solution so each time 90 liters was not removed out of 100 liters 
and this step was done three times. So I get uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.9 raised to uh, uh, 3, so that is 0 0.729, 0 0.729 into 100, I get 72.9. So as, a, as you could see, I got the same answer as doing these steps each time. But uh, if you get uh, uh, if you get like the number of iterations as 20 or so, it becomes impossible to actually write down each step like this. Uh, instead of uh, that, if you write down the equation, it will become easier for you to calculate. If you have the calculator, you can calculate 0.9 raised to 20 easier than doing these calculations by hand. So this is how you use the formulas for mixtures and allegations. Now let's move on to the concept of profit and loss. Uh, here I'll be focusing mostly on defining what the terms are. So most of you would know what is, uh, so uh, let me first like define what is cost price. So if suppose the situation is that there's a shopkeeper and there's a consumer. In this case, the cost price is the price at which the shopkeeper buys. Price for shopkeeper. Selling price is the price at which he sells to the uh, consumer. So the profit for the shopkeeper is equal to selling price minus cost price. Suppose selling price is less than cost price, then loss is essentially, then he's selling at a loss and then loss will be selling cost price minus selling price. Profit percentage is defined as a percentage of the cost price. So that is SP minus CP divided by CP into 100. Uh, this is all for this profit, this profit percentage is from the perspective of the shopkeeper because he is buying at a particular rate and he is selling at a particular rate. Now suppose if there are like three people involved, there is like a wholesaler, there is a shopkeeper and there is a consumer, then the selling price for the uh, shopkeeper wholesaler is equal to the cost price for the uh, ho selling price for the wholesaler is equal to the uh, cost price for the shopkeeper and the selling price for the shopkeeper is equal to the cost price for the consumer. So there is a chain like this, the selling price for the person upper in the uh, flow of thing is the that selling price becomes a cost price from me. Uh, my uh, selling price becomes the cost price for the person who is buying from me. So this is a way you should consider the uh, uh, this as such. Always remember the profit is counted as a percentage of the cost price. So uh, the once the shopkeeper buys something and he puts it in his shop, he's not going to put the actual cost price or the selling price on it. So what they will do is that they'll put a marked price on it. So marked price is essentially the uh, price uh, that is put on the sticker on the uh, on the item. So marked price is that. So ma actual selling price, uh, on, the, on top of that marked price, he'll give you a discount to like uh, entice you to buy. So discount is basically mark price minus selling price. So we'll say, okay, I'll give you 10 rupees discount on this. So if the mark price is 120 rupees, your actual selling price would be 120 minus 10, that is 110 rupees. So percentage discount is defined as a percentage of mark price because if I say 10% discount, I will be taking 10% of 120 rupees. That is the price put on the object as such. So this is discount by mark price into 100. Uh, uh, this is the, uh, this for the, uh, uh, from the uh, mark price, this is discount from the perspective of the uh, buyer. So he got 10% discount on the thing that he bought. Uh, from the perspective of the wholesaler, how does he decide the mark price? He uh, decides the mark price by adding a markup to his cost price. So markup is basically mark price minus cost price. So suppose I bought something for 100 rupees. I'll put a 20 rupee markup on it and put like a mark price of 120 rupees on that item. So the markup in this case would be 20 rupees. Percentage markup is also defined as a percentage of cost price because I'll put a 20% markup in this case. So as you can see profit and markup are a percentage of cost price. Discount is a percentage of mark price. The last thing that we'll learn is margin. So margin is basically same as profit. But instead of uh, uh, profit percentage is a percentage of cost price, margin percentage is a percentage of selling price. So why is this uh, done? So for example, if I say if I'm a big company and have I say that I have revenues of 100 crores. So when I describe my profit, I have to describe how much of those 100 crores are actual profit. So if I say my margin is 10%, and my revenues are 100 crores, then my profit, uh, my margin is essentially 10% of the 100 crores 
that is 10 crores so margin is defined as a percentage of selling price so people often get confused between profit percentage and margin always just keep this distinction in mind profit percentage is a percentage of cost price margin percentage is a percentage of selling price that is these are the key things that you need to remember while solving uh, profit and loss questions all you need to do is basically write down these equations and you'll be fine now let's go on to the uh, most often asked type of subtype within profit and loss that is a faulty balances so essentially whenever you are having faulty balances uh, either while selling or buying uh, you have to make sure that you calculate the effective cost price that is all you have to do so what do i mean by faulty balances so for example you will be given that uh, there is a uh, shopkeeper who cheats uh, while buying so while buying from the wholesaler he uses a faulty scale which gives him like say 1100 grams uh, while showing 1000 grams in this case what you have to do is you have to say that the actual effective cost price is 1000 by 1100 so this is the effective cost price for me so whatever is the cost price mentioned uh, the actual effective cost price CPE is the cost price mentioned in 2000 by 1100 this is the effective cost price and this is what you should use while calculating profit now if you have to uh, if somebody cheats while selling that is while selling it to the consumer instead of giving 1 kg he gives you only 900 grams so again you have to calculate the effective cost price so the effective cost price would be 900 by 1000 into the uh, stated cost price so if you once you calculate it, calculate the effective cost price irrespective of whether the person is cheating while buying or cheating while selling you will be calculating um, uh, correctly calculating the end profit percentage as such so just focus on calculating the correct effective cost price for the person so this is the basic uh, fundamentals for profit and loss let's move on to interest so interest uh, there are two types of interest one is simple interest and compound interest Simple interest is basically the interest formula is P into R into T where divided by 100 where P is the principal that is the initial amount that is invested, R is the rate of interest and T is the time period for which it is in invested. Uh, compound interest, uh, interest CI is calculated as P into 1 plus R by 100 raised to T minus P where P is the principal invested, R is the period for which it is invested, uh, R is the rate of interest divided by 100 raised to the time period for which it is interested. So the thing that uh, the difference between uh, SI and CI is that in case of comp uh, uh, compound interest the interest earns interest. So after the first period of compounding so for the first period of compounding SI will be equal to CI after the first period of compounding the compound interest will have the SI component that is the interest earned on the principal plus the interest earned on interest. So always CI after the first period of compounding will be greater than your SI for the same period. So essentially whenever you are given the uh, difference in CI and SI you are being given the what is the interest that is earned on interest that is the simple interest on on interest. So af for the first after the first compounding period you earn the interest on the interest earned in the first period. In the second pe uh, after the second compounding period you earn the interest earned on the interest earned in the second period and in the first period and so on. So it keeps on cumulatively being added. So uh, these are the two basic formulas that you have to remember. Uh, in compound interest you have to be careful about the rate of compounding. So suppose the rate of interest is 10% per annum and you invest for like 5 years but the compounding is done semi-annually. In this case the interest uh, you calculate that as 1 plus you take for uh, if the rate of interest is 10% per annum for half a year it will be 5%. So that is 5, per, five by 100 raised to 5 uh, five years into half year periods would be 10 p half year periods. So this uh, the compound interest would be p, my, uh, p into 1 plus 5 by 100 raised to 10 minus p. So this is what the uh, formula would be. So always be careful about the rate of compounding as well. So these are the basic formulas for geometry and arithmetic. We will be taking a look at other quant topics in uh, a separate video. So this is a revision video where if you have come across any formula or any concept that uh, you are not comfortable with or you wanted to look uh, more in detail at that particular concept please go to the other classroom sessions make sure that you reread that particular concept. This is just revision just to make sure that you have covered most of the must do things in quant as such. 
uh, please let us know if you want us to cover something in more in detail in any of these topics and we'll try to do that uh, so uh, make sure that uh, you are uh, practicing uh, uh, you're spending a lot of time practicing from now on uh, this is the time when you should focus on practicing please make sure that you solve all the questions that are given in the classroom video please make sure that you see all the related videos in the description box so uh, take as many concept tests as possible concept tests are the best way for you to check whether or not you actually understand a concept so make sure that you see all concept videos take also all concept tests and solve all co questions that are given in the classroom session Thank you for tuning in.